Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dust Up. I am Al Madrigal. I'm joined as always by my good friend, actor, comedian, and director Jay Larson. What's up, Jay? What's up? Al, Al, look at us today. Look at you. You look unbelievable. What are you doing? What have you been walking red carpets? What's the story? I'm rolling out my beard for Lopez versus Lopez, the uh, NBC show I'm on. I play um, Oscar, who's like this stoner, a loser in the back of the moving van. Great episode for me this week. So I just rock a cheech beanie and to wear moving outfits constantly. Yeah, but why are you looking local. so good today? You got a blazer on. I mean, you look you look. I actually here. go to a screening at the Pacific Design Center later on this evening, so I thought I would just dress for that because I'm going to be cutting it close. So me and my wife got to chill in the car and jam over there. I love it. I yeah. love it. I try to look sharp all day. Huh? I'm wearing cords right now. Ooh, cords are a nice. What color? It's a. It's like a rich brown. Yeah, I can see that. You get, you get that shirt tucked in, or you untucked right now. I'm untucked currently because I got that shirt on. So, but will you be tucked? Yep, you'll stay untucked with the two buttons undone. I like it. It's a good look yeah. at Pacific Design. What do you got yeah. on your shoes? Do you got shoes well, on? You have- I got these low top Jordans, and they look pretty good. You do look good. I've seen. I see some press stuff happening for you, and I see you out there on the red carpets. And I got to tell you, you're in good shape. And it- I'll spruce that up. I like your upper body. Well, so all these Latino guys go out that I'm doing all of this press with. I went down to Mexico City with this big group, and they were all dressed. Everyone's dressed to the nines, and everyone's looking sharp. I went out shopping with those guys, and I, they were trying to put all. They're like, "Hey, try this purple long jacket." I'm like, "Guys, I can't wear a purple long jacket." Okay, uh, I always look like a dad going to sign insurance paperwork. That's my thing. So I am. Uh, I'm really. I try to, you know, stretch it a little bit, but for the most part, it's conservative. But when you get these red carpets and stuff like that, you got to stand up. You're like, guys, I'm not a black comedian. You know, now, what I, mean? I can't wear a purple jacket. Black guys again. They. Fraud. They really outfits the the world is their oyster when it comes to wardrobe. They yeah. can pull everything off. They can wear anything and just crush. Yep, sure. I love um, it. Anyway, what do you know if I if I mention the names to you? Of course, this is the the dust up folks. You're listening because you know this is the podcast mm-hmm. about famous fights, feuds, and melees. And we're equipped to talk about this subject or any beef because Jay and I have been known to mix it up a little bit. That's why we're here. But why mention and, the names? Can I be a counterpoint to you in saying, too, that famous beef that you may not know about, and we're equipped to talk about it, but we are not experts in any capacity. Not experts at all. I mean, the opposite of experts. We just loosely have some information. That's but it. I, I think we're both good at empathizing with these current situations. So we've led to the beep, and, and that's where we'll yeah. get some takes. Anyway, Anthony Daniels, do you know who he is? Just because I've had to do research for our yes. podcast, Anthony Daniels played C-3PO in the Star Wars. And did you know that every Star Wars? Every single Star Wars. Kenny Baker, do you know who he is? I mean, I think we all do. First of all, Kenny Baker, if you said who played R2-D2 and someone said Kenny Baker, you'd be like, yeah. It's almost like R2-D2 is like the translation for Kenny Baker. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't think R2, if you said, what, what would that droid's like American dude's name? Oh, or just if, like- if R2-D2 had a human name, it would be, hey, look, Kenny, come here. Over here. Yeah, Kenny it's, is uh, a... That's kind exactly. of cool. I totally think R2-D2 would be named Kenny if he had a human name. All right, that's yeah. great. Um, so I buy that, and of course, Kenny Baker is the three foot eight circus performer who George Lucas saw who ended up becoming or being inside R two D two because they needed him to whoa, just. Whoa, whoa, Al! It's a family. It's a family show. Okay, it's a family whoa. show. I love to be inside you. Um, yes, which I think is amazing that. Lucas is out there looking for a circus performer, or who, like, who even knew that there was a human inside there? Yeah, I, I had no idea. You just assume, even though it was the seventies, that they would be able to like control that thing with a, a remote. Uh, 
remote control or something. Yeah. I mean, you can hit light speed. You can't get a robot to move. I'm older than you. I saw Star Wars in the theater. We went to the Coronet Theater in San Francisco. And considering the history of Lucasfilm, like that was the theater to see it at. The Coronet was our big theater. It was actually right near our producer, Ben Kalin's house. And I went with a bunch of kids from my block, the Mian Brothers. I think I went seven. Oh, the Mian. Marvel is Mian Brothers? <laughs> the the Mian Brothers, yeah. Me and They're the Mian Brothers. Performers? Me and brothers were actually a, a comedy act. Three of them, right? Yeah. One passed away. But Chris Meehan, Howard Meehan, and Mike Meehan were pretty much responsible for me doing stand-up because they, from a year, very young age, speaking of beefs, I think their mom, Valerie Meehan, got in a beef with the lady at St. Anne's near my house. I was a block away from St. Anne's growing up in San Francisco. The Meehan's went there. She got in a beef with the principal. I needed somebody to take me to school. So I ended up going to the French school because of the me and brothers that I went to Notre Dame de Vitois. That a hey, couple things. One, do you think you should be airing Valerie's dirty laundry on this podcast? <laughs> First of all, Valerie, unfortunately, recently has also passed away. Okay. So, then let's talk some shit about her because I heard she was just no, she was the best woman. So that's what my mom really valued her insight. And she really was a fantastic person. And she had her kids transferred to this other school, so I transferred along with them. But I started in kindergarten at Notre Dame de Victoire. That just okay, and I will say that tying this full circle, one time Mike, me, and picked me up at the airport, and I went to Golden Gate Park to pick his kids up with him from camp. It's fucking crazy. Yep. And you were doing the punchline that week. Yes. So anyway, the Mian brothers took me to the Coronet. That's where I saw Star Wars seven times. Star Wars was a big deal when it came out. But what we're learning and through the process of this podcast that Anthony Daniels, classically trained actor. Barely. Barely classically trained? I mean, if you first of all, can I just say this? If you go to Anthony Daniels' Wikipedia, because let's be honest, when you're doing some research nowadays, you're going to Wikipedia. The first thing it says, Daniels was born in Salisbury, Wilshire, England, the son of a plastics company executive. Already, I'm like, fuck you. This little rich kid, of course he was a bitch. <laughs> so this is what happened that led to the disrespect. He didn't want to take the job initially, so... He had to have his agent convince him to take the gig as C-3PO. And so he's going to be inside this outfit. And he's a classically trained guy, right? Yeah. He had a disdain for all of his castmates, but especially for his on-screen droid companion, Kenny Baker, who played R2-D2. Because this guy's an actor, and Kenny Baker, this circus performer, it was in there just turning the head. And I think at one point this all started. First of all, anytime you hear somebody or refer to themselves classically trained anything, you know the guy's a dick. Yeah. I will also say this. You know, back then, there weren't, this was the, George Lucas wasn't George Lucas. They didn't know what Star Wars was going to be. Right? Sure. Secondly, if you go look up Anthony Daniels, he's got zero film credits before Star Wars. So I don't even think he was like, I think he was like a, wanting to be a stage actor, you know, yes. like an old British vibe where stage acting is where it's at. And so not only did he not want to play a droid, he also probably just didn't want to do movies because movies were little, like, little, little sci-fi movies beneath him. Yes, I think he thought any movie was beneath him. Sure. And then he milked it for into this with an attitude because he's a real actor and hero, you know, he's surrounded by people with an inferior skill set. Yes. That's his attitude going in. So he's a dick. They were very clear. This C three PO and C three PO is a robot kind of a dick. Like, oh, Master Luke, Master Luke. Like he's not he is like very I think he's not thick. C three PO? Yeah, I just think he's oh, uh, not, he's not an asshole, but he is like a proper but he's almost like a butler type of robot. Yeah, for sure. He's proper and he's uh 
he's so skittish, you know, he's worried about everything. It's like, dude, chill the fuck out, man. You're like on three different planets. You're cruising around the galaxy. You think when they constructed, used AI to construct the robot that they would have toned down the anxiety. But they didn't. <laughs> but it's, it's one of the most humanizing things about him as a droid, don't you think? That he's he's always so nervous and so worried. Remember when his yeah, like, legs fell off and he's like, oh, I'm such a mess. <laughs> his worry levels just they increase like his his uh anxiety and and sense of uh he's like basically he's he's very frightened about the potential problems uh he's a good guy to have around if you really want uh he, he's definitely cares he spoke Looks every like language he was a translator robot and so then you have kenny baker who comes in it's just a guy from the circus so he's like the opposite of Anthony Daniels, and he seems like he really enjoys being in Star Wars over the course. He's thrilled. He loves the fans. He loves when people recognize him. But uh, let's go. Let's go to like before they even get it. Baker was on like a talent show at the time and almost didn't want to do Star Wars because he was like getting close to the finals with the rest of his like castmates. You know, like he was in like a like a comedy troupe. He had already done film. That guy was like in it. He was think about what he was doing. He was doing America's Got Talent or Last Comic Standing, and you got Anthony Daniels over here who just graduated Tish. That's what you got. You know what I mean? You got the guy who is three foot eight, who's like, I got to do anything I can to succeed, and then you got Anthony fucking Daniels. <laughs> dad is running a plastics company, doesn't give a shit about the environment, just pushing in the ground, making two hundred eighty k a year. In 1946. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's killing it. So he can afford to have this fancy son mm -hmm. who's going to, um, wants to declare that he's an actor and who get class down people. movies because he doesn't need the money. Exactly. So I think the beef starts between these two when R2D2, Kenny Baker, admits to. Anthony Daniels that he he asked for like context or and it somehow, somehow the script came up and that's when he, he, Kenny Baker admits I didn't read the script and that's when Daniels if he had any respect for Kenny Baker at all it's out the window because he didn't read the script well but in, in all fairness he's in there just turning ahead he's not doing of course what does he need to read the script for well, th th there was a point that came up where Anthony Daniels wanted him to turn to look at him when he was saying something. So, it's to Anthony Daniels' credit, he's really trying to do a good job. And now you're working with, it's like a, a really accomplished architect working with someone with a much lower skill set, like a guy who's just like a cement mixer or something. But isn't this kind of the genius of what Kenny Baker is? Because C-3PO is always trying to get R2 to do what he wants, and he can't. He's like, oh, R2. He's always nervous about him. It kind of fits. And if maybe Anthony Daniels would loosen the fuck up, he would understand Kenny Baker is actually making you a better actor. But all professions have Anthony Daniels, right? True. We absolutely. Now, you've acted quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten into it on set with another actor or thought you were like superior to the other actors or comedians that you were working with. Okay. One out. I'm not a sociopath Two, Uh, no, I haven't, but I will tell you this. I did a little movie called the invitation. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a really good thriller and there's some really talented actors in it. Why did it was in the invitation with the plot of the invitation? Uh, the plot of the invitation now. So gets everyone gets invited to a dinner party, um, and it just that's all you need to know. I don't want to ruin it because if you haven't seen it, it's a really good movie with a lot of plots and twists and turns. Logan Marshall Green, Mikhail Hauschman's in it. He was in Game of Thrones. This I'm is, sure I, to recognize John Carroll Lynch. You would know. Um, I'm drawing blanks right now, but uh, anyway, anyway, good movie, and we should go. I'm gonna check it out. I didn't know you were in that. Okay, so in while I'm doing I'm doing one scene, and Mikkel is a very accomplished dude. He's on Game of Thrones at the time. He's, he's huge. I think he's 
from Denmark. Anyway, he's off camera, but he's going to give me lines. And every time I have to do my lines, he would just look at me from off camera and be like, and it's a very intense movie. And he kept doing that. And they yell, cut. I go over and go, why are you doing that? And he goes, I don't know, man. I just love fucking with you. And it to me, I didn't care. I thought it was hilarious because I just was like undermatched in all these scenes. So there was no part of me that was like mad. I thought it was hilarious and fun. There could That could have led to drama, but I'm a passive guy. You know what I mean? I forgot this story. I was doing a TV. I'm not going to mention any names. So I was doing a TV pilot. And then the director sent us the last day. Director's son comes to set. Hold on a second. You've done a lot of TV pilots and a lot of TV shows. Where in your career is this one? Because that will that will inform us of how you might or may not react. In the middle, I got good stories. But I didn't say anything in this case, but it was a similar situation that you just reminded me of. Okay. This, the director's son put one of those horse head masks on. Yeah, this I know that. This emotional seat for me. And was in my eye line just going like this with a horse head mask. And the director didn't say anything. And if it was anybody else, I would have gone, hey, can we move, maybe move that kid in the horse head mask? You know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to tear up over here. And you think we can get the horse head guy out of here? Yeah. But I'm no classically trained actor, but I got to work on it. And uh, if I'm going to be pulling out some tears and emotion. And then I have gotten it with, with other actors that thought they were feisty. Was he doing that to mess with you? Yeah. Because he was a little off kill. Was he like a little off or was he just... I don't know. I didn't really interact with him. He was the director's son. I'm not going to fucking talk to the director's son. He was just off camera. He didn't mean... It was just like he was just fucking around and we were shooting. He was off camera like going like this with a horse head. And uh, I wish I... I didn't say a thing though. There are plenty of times where I have said something. And so I'll tell you those three. I have like two or three good stories for you, Jay. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. Incident number one. I'm working on a TV show. Famous actor. And he is in a bad mood. And he's fucking with the makeup people. And oh, it's boy. one of my very first things. And I'm, and then he looks at me and he goes, when's the last time you cried? Because I'm always happy. I'm like, I'm happy to be on set. Are you in the makeup chairs doing this? I'm in makeup. And he goes, when's the last time you cried? And I go, I don't know. And you know, doing a stand-up, you know when somebody's trying to fuck with you. I go, and Freddie Soto had just died. And I go, hmm, well, maybe when my best friend died, like a year and a half ago, two years ago. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. Like that, he knew he took it. And then he walked out of the room and make up people were like, oh, God, so they get all upset. And I go, hey, man, can I talk to you for a second? Would you follow him out? Yeah. <laughs> and I go I don't know what your deal is dude I think I actually do know I think you've been doing this too long you have lost all appreciation for how fortunate we are to be able to be acting and have these jobs I go it took my dad about a year to make what I'm making in a week and a half and I think you have lost all sense for how fortunate we are to be able to do this and you make all those people in there miserable. You need to stop. And he goes, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And wow, then, that could have gone either way. He could have. And then mm-hmm. he grabbed me and he goes, hey, I told my wife what you said. And she said, you're right. And again, I am just so sorry, man. Like, if I can just say, so that was great. And that guy, if Hold I on, see me- him to this day, he still mentions it. And loves me to death. And we have a great relationship. I love that. And I will say there is something similar to what's going on here between these two guys. In that Anthony Daniels might just come from a place where he doesn't need to have this job. Whereas Kenny Baker at the time is on a talent show trying to get known. And he's like, I need this. And like you just come in with way more grad to talking to people being kind. And if you're just like, oh, whatever, I'm going to go be this mine. I mean, he was a mine. You know what I mean? So I love that that story kind of relates to what's going on here. You're more of a, you know, R2-D2 in a bucket kind of guy. Yeah. Working amongst people that, you know, because again, 
I love acting, but I don't have formal training. So it really takes a lot of work. Now I will, when Kenny Baker said he didn't read the script, that's not me. Like I am, I pour over it. I know all my lines. So I do think that Anthony Daniels had a point. Like if you're going to take one of these jobs, you got to know what you're going in there doing. And to, you know, I've heard a lot of other actors say, we are being paid to be there on time, know our lines and stand on our mark. Like those are the basics. Yeah. Like, and you have to be professional when you go into them. And then there's something to being overly professional. So when like, we were talking about this before, if you are like a brain surgeon or consider yourself like a highly trained surgeon and you're working with next to a nurse or a scrub tech who didn't look at the patient file, then you have every right to be upset. Can I give you an example, Al? Sure. But it's just, again, it's, it's acting. But I do understand how a professional and somebody who really prides themselves on their work could be upset with somebody who hasn't done the work. I saw a cool like Q&A the other day. Who's the guy that played uh, Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook? Jesse Eisenberg. Yep. And he's talking about acting with uh, Kieran Culkin, the kid from... Uh, sure. You Success. know... Yeah, and he said they're doing. I don't know what they were doing together. I'm not sure. And he goes, but they get to set. And uh, he said that Culkin never wants to work. He always wants to be with his family. He always doesn't want to work. It looks at work like it's a burden. And he, after they had invested a million into this movie, he tried to back out, but he did. So they get to set this one day, and uh, Culkin goes, "Hey, what's going on, man? Jesse, good to see you, man. Excited to do this with you." He goes, yeah, and he goes, and Culkin looks at me, goes, uh, what, "What scene are we doing today?" <laughs> and Jesse Eisenberg goes, uh, we're doing the one with the five minute monologue you have on the train. He goes, oh yeah, 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 I like that one. All right, cool. I gotta get some sides. And he hadn't read it nothing. They got him sides, and he and he goes, Jesse goes, do you want to run it? And he goes, no, 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 no. I don't want you to see anything I'm gonna do. I don't want to know anything you're gonna do. Nothing, no. And he said when they shot it, he was like mad and had it. I'm saying, Kenny Baker, yeah. oh, maybe the same way. No, 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 no. Kenny Baker was in there spinning a head, but he needed to know what the script was and when he needed to spin the head. He needed to look at it. So, like, I don't think Kenny Baker's an actor. I don't think R two D two did anything that was like that. Doesn't make Kenny Baker. Kenny Baker was five years away from being replaced by a remote controller. Like, you know, he was not like he was not something that was essential to that character he was just essential at the time and they were very nice to let him do all the future films and uh because they did not need him at all there's no way this kenny baker was in amadeus bro what are you doing amadeus what did he do in amadeus i'll tell you exactly what he did he did what uh was- like the parody common dent or he was also in the elephant man he was in Willow. He was yeah, in... I'm sure he can act. At Time Bandits, was he in that as well? Uh, yes, he was. He played Fidget. Yeah. So the guy can clearly act. I'm just saying he should have fucking read the sides, man. He should have known what he was doing that day. Just like, I mean, and so anyway, it just doesn't matter. I'm just saying like, I kind of... Res- I get that. Look, and we have it in stand-up, man. Like, and then baseball players have it. Like, you know, like if you think there's like different levels to everything. And then if somebody shows up that you think is not on, you know, is not put in the time or put in the work, then it's, you're going to disrespect that person. I think Daniels was definitely an asshole about it, though. Like, he should be. Which I want to get into more of how he was an asshole. But the thing that I find interesting in this is that. If you talk about in cinema, in film history, who are some of the most iconic best friends in history? R2-D2 and C-3PO are like Bert and Ernie. You know what I mean? Like I used to, I had two aunts, great aunts. They lived together for 90 years, both spinsters, 90. And Auntie Rue was tall and thin and Auntie Gert was like a little hunchback and she was very short. And I used to joke that she was C-3PO and she was R2-D2 because they had these same personalities. Bert and Ernie, same thing. Spinster is code for lesbian, isn't it? I don't 
I mean, maybe back then, but I don't, neither of them were out, so maybe they were lesbians. I don't really know. That would have been dope. Imagine having like an 85 year old aunt who's just straight lesbian. Just yeah. that, that she definitely is. So, we did, so, yeah, it was just, it's unfortunate they couldn't come out at the time because that's the other thing with this beef. Uh, speaking of the gays, um, Kenny would call Anthony gay. That's the other thing. But he would make fun. C-3PO is a gay robot, right? No, gay robot was Nick Swardson. It was a show on <laughs> Comedy Central. <laughs> um, I don't know. No one never. I don't know. Is there anywhere in the logic saying just because he's effeminate that he's a gay robot? I thought he was always a gay robot. But Anthony did. But I thought Kenny had all this beef because he made fun or talk down to him for being a little person. I think that's part of it. I think, again, it started with Kenny admitting he hadn't read the script. And then they got into calling each other gay, making fun of the hype. It just all devolved from there. I will say this. Now, not for stand-up comedians, because we're around a lot of misfit children, right? But there are some people that around little people get a little freaked out. Now, Brad Williams, comedian, Mutual friend of ours, I imagine. I've done shows with Brad, and when he gets on stage, he's like, oh, yeah, you were going to go to the bathroom. And then you're like, no, I got to see what this little fellow's got to say. He even said, like, there is an attraction or a pushback for some people around little people. I wonder if that was something with Anthony Daniels as well, especially coming from this bougie plastic uh, magnet he came from. Absolutely. At the time, I think... Kenny tells a story about being in a bar and getting picked up by a drunk. I think if you are a, a little person in a bar and people are drinking, now these little people, you know, from any Wizard of Oz, they're the biggest drunks. Their little people are getting hand over the place. That's a generalization, isn't it? It just takes like one or two beers and just choo, choo, gone. And so um, they're getting wasted. And so Wizard of Us, it's it's really a real thing. Like they were partying super hard. Orgies, the whole thing. Little people party hard. They do. So yeah. anyway, you go to a bar though and you're a little person, somebody's like trying to pick you up. And that's exactly what happened to Kenny on a regular basis. So it is a very difficult time. You know, in the seventies, to be you know, a a drunk, and you know, around drunks in uh, at being a little person for sure. So it's yeah. it's gonna be tricky. And then uh, tell our producers telling he would constantly call him little man, hey little man, which you know, if you're if you're boys, cool. If you're not, that's not gonna go well. And he said, uh, "Go away, little man." He really degraded me and made me feel small. For want of a better expression, he's rude to everyone, though, including the fans. That's right. And Star Wars fans, not exactly. They're there, and we, we're some of them, my wife especially, and her uh, brother, my brother in law. My brother in law is such a Star Wars fan that he would fabricate and sell his own Stormtrooper outfits. For, for what? For like adults? Yeah, he'd make his own stormtrooper outfits. Then they looked real. That's amazing. My wife and uh, her brother are crazy fans, but Star Wars fans have lashed out. They attacked Kelly Murray Tran. Uh, that was the actress who faced a barrage of online hate armed at her appearance and ethnicity. She had to delete all of her social accounts. She told The Hollywood Reporter that the entire Star Wars experience felt like she fell in love very publicly and then very publicly had an embarrassingly horrible breakup. And then, you know, super fans are tough people to get along with. I remember from being on The Daily Show, we'd go to the Republican National Convention, the Democratic National Convention, and that was where all of our super fans, that was like our, you know, all of our fans were in one spot. It was your Comic Con. And, yeah, it was. Uh, it, was, it, was it was political Comic Con. Yeah, for sure. It was political Politicon. I think they actually did that. 
um, in Pasadena. I was part of that a little bit, but it was a big convention for everybody in the party, obviously, to come to. And it was was tricky to walk around. So mm-hmm. I get like, you know, being bombarded by nerds is being a difficult thing, you know, like this these fans. And again, Star Wars fans have kind of flashed out at actors. They they have been um difficult to uh, appease when changes in the universe sort of uh, get introduced. Yeah, well, I mean, I get that. I mean, well, that sounds what Kelly Marie Tran might have been dealing with. I feel like, though, with Anthony Daniels, this was more of like, like at these autograph signings, from what I've read, is that he was a total douche to anyone working behind the scenes and then would throw on the happy face when you're working with people that are there to see him and and see the fans. You know what I mean? I feel like Kenny was more like a, I'll go out after the show and hang out at the bar with everyone after the stand-up show. And then Anthony Daniels was like, I'll hold a private meet and greet and it's 50 bucks a head. You know what I mean? Like there's a difference between comedians that are going to like, of how they're going to embrace their fans. And Anthony was probably very like, nope, it's going to be like this. I want it like this one person at a time. You know, he might have a little OCD going on there too. Yeah. My first day in Hollywood, I got Cheech. I was on a show with Cheech from Cheech and Chong. I was playing my dad. And he brought me to Hugo's on Santa Monica uh, for lunch. And he said, two pieces of advice that I want you to live by. One, because this was right after a busboy came up and asked him for his autograph. It was, one, be nice to every single person you encounter. Because everyone is going to love to tell their t- cheech is an asshole story. And then also the second thing, you want mailbox money. You just own as much of this content as you possibly can. Because, um, you know, I have, I've owned all my albums. I've directed all these movies. They had 10 albums out at the time. You know, they, they owned every single bit of music. Basketball Jones was being used in commercials. He goes, every single day a check shows up for like $20,000, $30,000. And that's because owning your content is huge. And this is Cheech in 2003 telling me this. And that's why we started on uh, All Things Comedy. That was the inspiration for All Things Comedy. Help people sell their content. So there you go. But the be nice to everybody is very important. And yeah, I, I, I really do think a lot of actors and musicians and performers and anybody, even at work, lose sight of you know what other people are going through and just when you are a big shot on set how exciting it is to uh for somebody to to meet these people or interact with them or you know the waiter at the restaurant who gets to wait on leonardo dicaprio it's a big fucking deal it's a huge deal so you just you can't be a dick to the the folks that are consuming all these content and then vice versa you know, the the fans really, they, when you do see somebody out in public, it's important for them to let, you know, like, let them have their space. Let them try to be a normal person. I guess people well, feel sure, about that. but I'm sure Anthony Daniels had plenty of space because no one could tell who he was or Kenny Baker. They're both in these droid suits. I will tell you this. Um, this is just my side Star, Star Wars story. When Return of the Jedi came out, which, by the way, Kenny Baker was supposed to play Wicket in Return of the Jedi. Instead, he played the, he got sick and he ended up playing um, one of the Ewoks that stole. Remember when they steal the stormtroopers like uh, Land Cruiser, one of those little tiny things? He he plays the little, uh, the Ewok that steals. Remember that one guy that steals it from them and takes off on him? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Kenny Baker, baby. Anyway. When I was a kid, we go away every summer to New Hampshire, right? To Lake Winnipesaukee. And one of the things we would always do while we were there for a week is we would go to a movie at least one night. Like back when movies was like a giant thing. And Return of the Jedi was out. My brother is nine and decides, I want to sit on my own. I don't want to sit with the family. I need my own space. And the place is packed, you know? So he sits down one row. We're down another row. And he's like, three down and one row back from us. And he's sitting next to these older guys 
Uh, I, I, I don't know how old, but from what we can gather, one was a Vietnam veteran because every time they would be in the woods, this guy would freak out and start going, search, search, search. But and like every, t yeah. And my brother's sitting right there. My brother's like freaking out next to him. Everyone's looking at him. My brother's so scared. And his buddy's going, all right, calm down, buddy. Calm. It's all right. Everything's good. You're fine. You're fine. And then he calmed down. They get back to the woods. Search, search. My brother, he's like, crawls down. He's like, can I sit with you guys? We're like, there's no scenes, bro. Like, you got to go sit with the freaking search guy. That was our That's return. Of the why do you, why do some kids at that age want to, like, I'm going to go sit by myself? Embarrassed to the family, you think? No, I think it's like, you know, it's just like you said, you need to give celebrities space. You know, you got to give your kids room to grow and room to be adventurous. I, I make my kids walk to school alone right now. I'm like, yeah, you walk, I walk you to here, you walk by yourself. They're like, walk with us. I'm like, have some space. This is where you grow. This is how you develop. Go on your own a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe get... if Anthony Daniels had given Kenny a little more space, I'm not saying it was a father-son thing there. Maybe it was tall guy, short guy. Either way, I think there could have been room. Also, Andy Daniels, the only person to be, you know, we talked about him being bougie about the fact that he was, thought he was better than everyone. He's the only person that's been in every single Star Wars. That's interesting. I think it's interesting as well. Also, and this well, is... What the residuals are like, like, do they get paid as normal actors? I don't know, because the way I, like, when I was looking at Kenny stuff, it looked like he was still trying to get out there. And like, some of the acting roles he took are like tiny little roles. I do know this. I have seen, I have seen a residual check stub that was Eddie Pepitone's from old school. Yes. So, Eddie, do you remember Eddie's role in old school? He was uh, one of the old guys. He was in the fraternity. He got kidnapped in the parking lot in a van. When he was yep. with his wife. He had very few speak speaking lines, if any, but he was in there. Yes, exactly nowhere near as big a role as C-3PO. And I saw one check from old school that was like a school teacher's salary from, you know, maybe 2004. 28 so, grand. Huh? 28 grand. <laughs> no, it was more than that. But what I'm saying is, yeah, I think these guys are... They, they, how could they not be set for life? They, they got to be set for life. Yeah, I think one speaking line. I remember thinking, hearing that if you got, I know an actress who had like one or two lines in one of the Toy Stories, and oh. those did so such big business that that was like four hundred thousand dollars in residuals, easy, just a Toy Story, and one line. Got gotcha you. That. Search and it said that Kenny Baker's net worth is two million bucks. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> those those things are never uh, accurate. Um, Jura says you're worth 40, 40 mil, forty million dollars. It's, it's probably right on. Uh, yeah. All right, how well do you know Star Wars? Uh, I I know it decently. I, I mean, my kids got me way more into Star Wars because my son was so into it, and I've seen everything. And I will say that Return of Skywalker, The Rise of Skywalker, I think is the best of all the Star Wars. And um, I hate Jar Jar Banks. I mean, hate. Her. My um, wife, as I said, I've always had this game around. So I dashed home before the podcast and grabbed a couple cards. Here we go. Well, yeah. Yeah. This, the, um, some Star Wars Trivial Pursuit. So I don't, I don't really think i could answer any of these things even though i like the movies watch the movies give me some well who did c3po describe as an impossible man you are an impossible man kenny baker no what character i know but come on now that's not a genius response if i was on tv right now i'd be getting the crowd would be going nuts uh but, you're an impossible man mr luke master luke you're an impossible man han solo that's Han Solo, that's correct. What vessel did C-3PO refer to when asking, are you sure this thing is safe? It's got to be the Millennium Falcon. Ah, it's an escape pod. Um, who did C-3PO call his high exaltedness? What? Luke? His high 
exaltedness. That was Jabba the Hutt. Where on Tatooine was C-3PO picked up by a Jawa sand crawler? The location was that? In? You know, I don't know. Out in the sand somewhere? It's a dune sea. Who did C-3PO refuse to follow on Tatooine because the terrain was too rocky? Who? D2. That's when the answer was. But but R2 was able to do it? Yeah, they had those little wheels of pop up. And he could also fly. Who do you think ends in a fight between those two? R2 or C3PO? Or who would you rather have as your droid? Oh, who wins in a fight is R2D2 easy. He's got low center of gravity. He's difficult, but he's also got that little saw that pops out. He's got a laser. He can fuck you up. He's got a hologram. It distract you and then hit you with the laser. He could fuck. Yeah, I C three PO has no weapons. He can barely run. He can't oh, run. His legs don't run. What a poor construction of a robot, too. There's no buy that you would make a robot with anxiety and with the inability to like move quickly. In both his arms are in like those full arm casts. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know. This is how he walks around. You want a couple more just for the hell of it? Yeah, give them to me. All right, who asked Luke if he'd consider changing his mind about landing on Dagobah? Obi-Wan. No, R2-D2. Who were the first non-Imperials shown piloting a scout walker? I didn't hear the question. Who were the first non-Imperials shown piloting a scout walker? This is exactly the thing that Ewoks. we were about. Those are the Ewoks, correct. Can I say this to you real quick? Are you a fan of the Ocean's Eleven movies? Yeah. I, I, I feel like I've seen all of them. I don't think I saw the one with Sandra Bullock, the Ocean's Eight, but I do feel like I've seen the rest of those. Okay. They totally took the Luke Skywalker R2-D2 relationship and use it with the... Uh, the, the little Asian guy who's like the gymnast, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As he speaks to them all, I don't know if, I, I'm not sure of his ethnicity, and they can all understand it, but we can't, and I think it's the funniest. The, the I love that tool. I love that it, as a way, like, they did that with R2, they did that there. Any other examples they've done that, Al? Oh, where they've just taken, uh... I'm no, sure. just like where you have a character that speaks a language that the audience can't understand, but everyone in the movie can't. Ben saying peanuts, the teacher. Yes. Nice work, Ben. Oh, that's true. That is such a fun little, call it a trope? What do you call that? Just a device. Oh, device? Is that a device? Are you going to give me any more questions or is that it for you? You, you, you haven't been great. Um, I'll I do never, one. You, don't know, you don't know any of them. I, I'm old them, so I knew a couple. I would think, who tipped Chewbacca off into an advancing Stormtrooper squad in Cloud City? There, um, R2. No, C3PO. You, you, uh, what sis? Okay, that's not good. What had C3PO just jumped inside of in Star Wars A New Hope when he sighed, I'm going to regret this? The pod, an escape pod. Boom. Because I got that from the question you asked before. I can't believe there's an entire game dedicated to this. Trivial Pursuit. I think there's multiple, like, levels and look when you get into and create a world like this yes it is and think about what big business this is and what disney has that they bought is like it is merchandise it's clearly it's all the tv shows by the way we're speaking of have you watched andor no not, we watched the first episode it's not for your kids it i is, know wonderful that is like one of the coolest star wars things i've ever seen i think they're like little mini series all cobbled together with the yeah. great serialized story throughout i think the dialogue is genius i just think everything about that i think that's the best thing that star wars has ever done i actually was i'm neighbors with the woman that was the cfo of disney and we were at a party with her last year and I said, hey, are you watching? Again, that's what I say to the CFO. I go, hey. Yeah. That's how close we are. I go, hey, you watching uh, Andor? 
And she goes, no, it's, uh, but um, I hear the numbers aren't great. And I go, well, it is easily one of the best Star Wars things that's ever been done. And she goes, oh, I'll have to pass that on. Do you know why the numbers weren't great? Saved Andor. Because it wasn't for children. Children were watching it. But I will say this. The Rise of Skywalker, I think, is maybe the best Star Wars ever. It's dark. It's gritty. Adam Driver is insane. It's awesome. I had a night. What was that one? Was it the Rise of... No, The Last Jedi. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went and I had Kristen and the kids were out of town. And my idea of a fun night out is I went and I parked a car, walked into Old Town. Then I had a couple bourbons and I had a turkey burger. So I got a few drinks in and a turkey Ooh. burger. Then I want to see that movie. What's that? Did you get arrested this night? I went to, this is what happened. I go to see that movie, packed, opening weekend. I sit right in the middle. Solo, lonely man seat for one. And I must have fallen asleep. Because I woke up and I snore at two bourbons. Two bourbons and a turkey burger in a movie? Just yeah, turkey gone. burgers like eating Thanksgiving dinner, bro. So he, um, whoever was by, he wants to kick the chair. And I woke up and um, all of those red stormtroopers were fighting in that really cool scene. And it was safe. But um, yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna love everything Star Wars puts out. Unfortunately... Um, Boba Fett, not it for me. But do your children like it? I mean, I think Boba Fett is probably the coolest character that they came up with. And then yeah. the Mandalorian, yes, my kids liked it. The Mandalorian was just like the coolest thing they came out with. That Mandalorian was is great because he doesn't take the mask off. Like when Boba Fett without the mask and those little kids on the yeah teenage, the teenage scooter gang that they had. Like I was, I wasn't really into it, but I like it. I like that Bill Burr's in uh, Mandalorian, which is really cool. When Burr was in Mandalorian, I made my read make a video to send Burr and say, hey, I really liked you in the Mandalorian, and I texted to Burr, and Burr texted a little, little video back like, hey, thanks, guys, you know, yeah, it was fun, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, like, I think Reed was five, six maybe at the time, and, like, we're on the playground later, and he's, like, talking to some kids. He's like, you watch Mandalorian? Kid's like, uh, yeah. He goes, yeah, we know Bill Burr. And the kid's, kid's like, I don't know who the fuck Bill Burr is. What are you talking about? All right. When you're working on a movie or a TV show or even at work in your office place, try to be nice to everybody, no matter what their training is. Maybe they're going to say something that sets you off and you think they're less professional than you are, but it, it just doesn't matter. Like, it's okay. You don't need to get all worked up. It's not good to go into things, you know, with a, an attitude and a, and a sense of superiority. It might elevate your game. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's exactly what it might do. Who do you, do you kind of have a side on this one? I'm not saying you need to pick a side, but is there anyone that you like, you relate to out of the two of these guys? See oh, I get, I get why the trained actor was pissed at the guy who hadn't read his script. But I also... Um, I, I totally understand. Um, I, I probably side more with the guy who was, uh, just a jovial sort of nice Kenny Baker or two D two, you know, if I had a pick sides. I like that. I mean, I, and then be like, come on, man, I'm just in here moving. Ahead. Like, what do we need? Like, I understand that you went to Juilliard and you're trained and you've got all that and you, and this is beneath you, but I'm thrilled to be here and be addictive. Do you have a Star Wars character you think that you would be perfect to play in any of the Star Wars you've seen? Well, I will tell you this. Um, after I had grown a goatee and I had, I, I think we would just gone back from Hawaii or something. I get really, really dark and our good, good friends were watching another show and Billy D. Williams came up and, um, this little kid goes, it's Lorenzo's dad. So I did get mistaken for Lando Calrissian. And Eric, he, he is the coolest character. I think Lando is badass. I love that Donald Glover played him in that uh, solo. I think Lando is uh, really cool. 
Did you go to the Star Wars pop up bar when it was in Hollywood? No. No, yeah. They, they did a cantina thing. You can go to that. They have the cantina at Disney that I wanted to go to, but didn't make reservations when we were there for my son's birthday. But next time, I'd play Han Solo if I could play someone. Were you in Pasadena last night? Yeah, I was in Pasadena. Nice. Okay. You were filming. Oh, that's right. Okay. I was crushing at the Ice House, bro. Crush fest. Ice House. I've been going there, actually, doing some sets. I know. I love it. It's been fun. All right. Um, this was fun, too, buddy. you have anything that you want to plug or anything that's uh, coming out? I'm on Lopez versus Lopez is coming out, new season. I encourage people to watch it. It gets weird, especially this episode that I'm doing right now. There's some really good jokes I'm, I'm excited about. Don't forget to email us, the Dust Up Pod at Gmail. You can call in. We're excited about this phone line, which is 925 727 3878. That is 925 727 Dust. I want to hear about your dust ups. Jay and I want to weigh in. And don't when- forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe, rate, Share it with friends if you're enjoying it. As always, check me out at Jay Larson Comedy on all social media and my YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. That's where I live. And um, follow us on social media as well. Theme song provided by the Flat Trackers, a great band from Australia. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. We'll uh, see you on the next Dust Up. Don't get any beefs. Don't get in any beefs up there. Everybody, let's, let's stay cool. Oh, get into beefs and tell us about them. All right. Let's do that.